Here we go. Thorsten Schröder, THS. Hello. You're very brave to uh, still sit here in this weather. My name is Thorsten Schröder. I am a... Uh, I, I started a while ago to think about open source licensing, free software licensing, and uh, asked myself how contemporary the currently in use open source licenses are with regard to our open source code being used by the military or by intelligence services or by uh, large corporations who are abusing the code for their, their own nefarious purposes. So how can we prevent um, misuse or abuse of our code? And that's what I want to start a new discussion about that has existed in the, in the last 10 years. So what drives a developer to publish his code, uh, sorry, to publish her code um, as open source, as free software, so other people can do something with that? So maybe the developer um, participated in open source projects in her youth, maybe uh, had developed something, and now uh, wants to give back to the community. So usually developers are, are driven by something good, right? So usually developers want to make sure that their code is not used for nefarious purposes, like military uses, intelligence services, basically anywhere um, that that puts people at um, in harm's way. So the first discussion, first part of this discussion is the um, the the events we had this year, where we can think about um, hacking team transparency report in July, where um, hacking team, the Italian company that um, sold surveillance software to repressive regimes and governments to infiltrate their computers and uh, exfiltrate data and, and audio recordings where people are then being uh, abducted or just disappear. So definitely people coming to harm. And not all of that um, is released by them. By, by them. So this example, for example, um, hacking team used code from Colin Mulliner who built a tool to debug um, Android systems uh, on the ARM platform. So he built a platform, and this framework is being used here. So after all the source code of hacking team landed up on GitHub after they were hacked, people started looking through the, uh, through the data, through the source code, and see if their own names appeared in some uh, form of ego Googling. And that's how they realized that, for example, Colin Mulliner's code and also code from FIFA and the ad guys, people from CCC, um, from, from DietLibC specifically, has been used by a hacking team. And that is the starting point for this debate. Um, at first, I, I thought to only do a lightning talk, but it's actually more complex because there's plenty of problems that makes it not as easy to uh, simply say, um, let's extend the GPL with a exclusionary clause. So, in the beginning of this year, I started thinking about um, about this problem when I saw DAPA release a a, um, a a press release about um, a, a air support system that they developed on the basis of Android, where basically the Air Force. Um, that uses manned and unmanned vehicles, they can simply uh, get target calls from from troops on the ground using an Android tablet. So they can basically um, touch to kill on, on their touch screens. And they, they, you can even decide which weapon you want to use to, to kill. So he, here it should be obvious that Linux kernel code and other open source projects are being used, are being actively used to kill people, um, and that cannot be controlled at the moment. I took this event as an opportunity to write up one clause that I could add to my favorite license. 
I've done a lot of stuff with the BSD license, so I thought let's just um, try try and create a exclusionary clause for the for BSD. Um, it's not as easy. Um, I'm going to go into more detail that later, but that's a discussion we we do need to lead again. Um, it's pretty old. It's been discussed more than 10 years ago in the Free Software magazine. There is an article from 2012 about the uh, the same issues. They come to a different conclusion than I do here, but in this article too there is a uh, rather long list of open source projects that are explicitly used in the military or made for explicit military use. Some of them very generic like GCC, Linux kernel, GNOME, but also open source projects that um, are expressively uh, created to be used for the military or uh, in military situations. Obviously, that's lots of them are software projects that deal with mapping data, with coordinate systems, and so on, simulations, uh, solid modeling. So very, uh, very uh, specific tools that are used by the military to wage war. And the conclusion of this article is that we cannot prohibit the military use and, and we may not do it either because that's the law. So we're talking about a law. The, the definition of open source forbids it and um, we don't want that to change. So every developer has asked herself how far can we take uh, liability for, for our own code. Um, independently of the license, uh, whether it's GPL or any, something else, many developers have thought about what happens if my code is being run on uh, medical devices, for example, or in nuclear power plants. And a bug that I created is responsible for the deaths of people or for screens just turning off in the middle of a presentation. So that's not really about a license in the end, but people have been thinking about that. And it's much easier to just distance themselves from um, military users, from weapon systems, or from having a code used for repressive tools, or repressive regimes, like in the hacking team case, for example. Everyone has thought about that kind of responsibility. And this is about ethics and um, philosophy apart from, from licensing. There's one group of developers who have thought about it in 2006. They uh, later called it the pacifist clause. The project was called GPU, the Global Processing Unit, a Nutella client that allows users to share CPU resources with other people. And they extended the GPL with the following. The program and its derivative work will neither be modified nor executed to harm any human being, nor through inaction permit any human being to be harmed. So a reference to Asimov's uh, Three Laws of Robotics. And they tried to, uh, to ensure that this code that was obviously had its military uses um, could not be used by the military. And they have no way to actually control that or enforce that. And there's a uh, argument of the, um, of, of the people opposing these clauses that you cannot control them. But such a statement allows us that in case we, we learn of such a um, violation of the license, that we can start an open debate. So what reasons do we have against extending licenses? Why don't we have these clauses already? Uh, one big reason is Richard M. Stallman, uh, who vehemently argues against these kinds of clauses because he says that that would make the software unfree um, if we would exclude some part of the state or the military to use uh, the software or parts of the software. So Stallman limits, wants to limit the developer's freedom to limit others' freedom. It's um, hard to to discuss this sensibly with Richard Stallman. Um, he also said he would 
find it very sad that um, if his friend who works for the Venezuelan military could not install any more Linux servers. So he says something needs to be free, and that is freedom as in total freedom, where freedom number zero is the the, the freedom to run the program as you wish, however you wish, and for any purpose. So for any purpose that clearly includes uh, killing other humans, surveilling other humans, um, propagating uh, oppressive regimes. So that's his view on software, and I think in today's time we should definitely think about whether that is still appropriate for this time and age. And we are having some technical difficulties here. Please stand by. In addition to these principles of Richard Stallman, there's also the so-called open source definition in opensource.org, which in paragraph 6 says that we may not exclude certain groups of users. Paragraph 6 says no discrimination against against fields of endeavor. So we may not limit our users, that's the, the open source definition says, but possibly we should change that. So those opposed to these exclusionary clauses uh, I, I, I already made that point uh, they they just they just say the, s the software has to be free but I think uh, by now we're at a point where we we can rethink uh, that issue and I think if if uh, s states can can change the regulations I mean we should be uh, just as as enabled to change our software regulations this is a way of ensuring or at least uh, trying to to make sure to um, to make it well not as easy for the people who who rely on our code to to make the risk higher uh, to make uh, punishment or legal enforcement possibilities simpler but in any case we should we should uh, we should be uh, enabled to to Well, to exclude certain forms of, of usage with, with our products itself as soon as we uh, deploy them. And this is the idea of a, of a non-military usage form. So when I read this, this DARPA news, news item uh, beginning of last year, um, the idea that I had at that time, I, th I thought uh, this might be for BSD, an exclusionary clause. Well, maybe I was a bit naive, and um, I wasn't really aware that there was even so much opposition from within the open source community. So uh, this is this is the text I wrote. Shall not be refused due to the matter of the national security concerns. Will it have an option to make a recommendation? With that, I only want to exclude that um, one certain developer is, is let, less important to, to make this uh, not always a matter of national security concerns. So it can be on, on, on several levels. It doesn't have to be that severe. But I do like the visual effects here on the screen.
but there are many many limitations for for this. Uh, the the GPL, uh, for instance, does exclude that you actually can exclude anything. And the, 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 this draft that I had, the first draft, this is still well on a quite easy level from from term terminology. But there are well, there are boundaries. There are there are some people who say, well, uh, well, I don't want my code to be used from the police or from the government either. And well, I'd say, well, that's something everyone should should uh, be able to decide for themselves. But uh, the problem is, where is the the exclusion uh, mechanism? So you have to have a clause that can be more or less concise, that has um, well, is legible and just something which is apparent. And if we don't note this or formalize this in a very con uh, concise form, well, no one will really take note. And so I think it's quite quite simple to to well find find boundaries to towards the military. Where does that start? That's quite uh, quite straightforward or obvious. But maybe some developers won't have um, have less problems. Maybe with the intelligence companies. Well, but that remains to be seen. And how can we now actually put that into action? Well, will Richard Stallman prevent us from actually modifying the license? But if we could have maybe another approach, something like Creative Commons, which I tentatively called Coding Commons. So just in the terms of the codes we, code we use so far, be it GPL or whatever, um, well, more more characteristics attached attached to a project that can be like modularly mounted uh, together from from different. Well, this is an um, amendment and not a modification, really, of the the GPL, but um, uh, the kind of idea that you can add on uh, in modular form. Well, this would be a kind of code commons module, which you could just write down and attach this to, to your. Well, the the, the main att attributes say it's non-military, non-intelligence, or consent consents required. So if if I write the code. Uh, the hardware that that uh, that it's going to be used uh, used on then finally is is the the user of the hardware actually actually aware um, and willing to have this this code executed on on the machine in question but this can be in the in the matter in embedded devices but similarly the the users have have lost control about uh, what is what is what's phoning home and have less possibilities to configure um, and modify themselves, and so that's something which isn't to be to be uh, which isn't really desirable for, from a user side, and so that's what the the consensus idea is for. And for everything else, I, um, I put I put the um, X for instance. So what whatever that may be, um, that you can specify, be it healthcare or I don't want it to be used for automotive. But um, here again, we have the problem that it's it's quite challenging to find short and concise um, definitions. So maybe I made an audio codec which is uh, used in a in a vehicle at some point later, and uh, well, in that in that manner, I could be uh, compromising the the vehicle security. Uh, with a delay, and so this is why uh, it's important to rely on these uh, user agreements. And so um, the enforcement, or the, the consequences, have to be well. Ev obviously, you have to find out that someone is 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 with uh, without the um, within not within the regulation. But um, so the the enforcement or the Punitive means are, aren't quite that clear, but you can, if you can, of course, uh, take this to court and uh, and sue and maybe f uh, enforce well the publication of code or or just make uh, just make uh, the 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 punishment part of a 
part of the contract in itself, which would be a kind of fine payment in the end. Uh, but this could be, uh, well, in the in the area of about a million if, if to, to make it interesting and to make people more compliant in these terms. So I think it's not um, worthless to actually try and define these quite con concretely, but at least I do hope that we have a more public debate about these issues. So even if maybe um, there, was a, there was a court case and a judge saying, well, we still want to make Bill send our rockets around with, with your code. Well, then at least we have the situation that there are being rights um, and negotiations made. And I think that's, that's uh, the, the overall target. So I think we should think about the possibilities that we have to, to realize or to at least outline something like this um, code in commons idea. And that's something that uh, a lot of um, coders would sh should sit down to uh, on, uh, around a table or a mailing list, whatever, and maybe to find a way to talk about this, maybe even to present something for, for Congress at the end of the year. So just to, to outline what is what makes sense, what is possible, and what is legal from from various perspectives. And I would just like to encourage you to, to think about this, about the possibility of these ex exclusion clauses, especially in security area, uh, exploit and bug, bug bounties or tracking due diligence. The, there are possibilities to, to prevent a certain companies from, from using this and can ensure that this is just transferred on a more immediate basis. And so if you want to take part in this discussion, do do um, please write me an e email. You can see my um, contacts here. And there is no uh, like finished concept, but I just wanted to put it out as an idea. And I'd like to really like to discuss it with you further.